Look, it's no secret by now that I love the Lisa series. I consider myself just a fan, not a rabid diehard fan, just a fan. I even own a t-shirt. Now I believe the heart of the series doesn't just lie in one quality, but in a multitude of unique ideas, bizarre non sequiturs, music, and disturbing narrative themes that are often absent from most AAA games. I can't even think of another developer outside of maybe Grasshopper Manufacturer that would even have the balls to touch some of the themes present in the Lisa games. I mean, who would have guessed that a drug-fueled, kung-fu-fighting odyssey through a wasteland of perverts to prevent a child rape from going down would end up having one of the most endearing stories that I and many of the Lisa fans have ever experienced. It's the player's connection to Brad Armstrong and the people of Olathe that holds up a mirror to our own twisted sense of self. Questions of what would I do in this situation, or having to decide between two extreme choices with no clear distinction between right and wrong, where either outcome leaves you with a sinking feeling in the pit of your stomach and the question of did I do the right thing remain. What I like most about Lisa is how many of the elements of the story are open to interpretation and not always spelled out concretely which led to many of the post-game conversations and fan theories with other players of Lisa. This story and its effectiveness are solely determined by the player's own perception of the outcomes. You can choose to accept or deny others' interpretations and write in your own, and that's what I do. So don't even bother shitting up the comment section of this video with your buddy is Brad's half-sister theories, because I don't even have enough patience to humor that boo-boo. What I'm getting at is that Lisa left a lot of room to open up and tell more stories about Olathe. But after the conclusion of the Joyful, it seemed as if Dingling was finished telling them. He has since shifted his focus to working on a new game called Ninja Tears, and according to a Steam profile and the amount of hours an RPG maker- oh, oh never mind. Well, in Dingling's absence, naturally came fan games based off of Lisa. And so far, I've only played one of them. Advinas Kondrotes developed and released Lisa the Pointless, Chapter 1, Mystics of Trash and Violence, which stands as a demo of a broader multi-part game. He released it for free on Game Jolt, and you don't need the original Lisa to run it. It's a standalone executable. The sad part is only 16,500 people have played it, and I'm not sure how big the Lisa fanbase is, but I'd like to do my part to promote this game, because it's definitely worth your time. If you're up for a challenge, that is. However, what sets this apart from your standard demo is that you're not just completely kicked to a title card saying coming soon. Instead, it's a fully functioning game that has a definitive beginning, middle, and end. So if the rest of the chapters never get completed, you won't feel screwed out of a conclusion. Before I get too far into this, I highly recommend you play Lisa the Painful first if you haven't. There's just no conceivable way to introduce you to how this game works and the nature of Olathe without making this entire video about Lisa the Painful RPG, which I've already done for you, so go check out that video. Alright, so this is a tale of Trash Island, where you play as the trash man, Alex Churchland, as he tries to escape his trash life by putting behind his life of scavenging through garbage in hopes of finding something better in Olathe. Now the beginning of the game is not too dissimilar from the painful, as we are given a glimpse into pre-flash incident Olathe and Alex's childhood of poverty and kung fu VHS tapes. I don't know if this was a slight nod to Napoleon Dynamite, where he learns dance moves from a thrift store VHS, but I found it both hilarious and a little endearing that Alex learned how to fight from a home video. Well, not very well, but we'll get to that. It hard cuts to the present, 
where the game wastes no time laying out how badly things are going in Alex's present life as he's literally taken out with the trash. He's then discovered when a sharp dressed local scavenger, Joel Miller, happens upon Alex while salvaging through junk. Side note, Joel bears a striking resemblance to Lee Van Cleef or Angel Eyes from the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. I don't know, I just found that kind of cool. So Joel nurses Alex back to health and we start to get a feel for Alex as a character. Now compared to Buddy and Brad, Alex seems pretty easy going on the surface. Alex's goal is to get off a of trash island and head to the city that lies in the middle of Olathe. Now before I get too deep into the gameplay, credit where it's due, Kondrotes is an RPG maker savant, and the soundtrack is still as great as ever, as most of the music here are just arrangements of Dingaling's previous work by Taitoki and Clovis. So if you've enjoyed the music up to this point, then you have a boatload of remixes and original contributions that do fit into the Lisa verse very well. I think Controtus pushed the RPG Maker engine to its absolute limits here. I also noticed a great amount of parallax scrolling that added a much deeper sense of depth to Olathe than ever before seen. Nice job. The sprite work still maintains the unique strangeness and outright fetal alcohol look that made the original so appealing to me. If you would have told me that Dingling was behind this game, I wouldn't have given it a second thought. It's as close to the source as you could hope for. That's the beauty of the pointless. The entire story spins off from the Lisa trilogy as a standalone title. There are still some slight connections and passing references of other characters from the earlier games for older fans to enjoy. This tale takes place just before Lisa the Painful. With that said, I still wouldn't recommend newcomers to the Lisa series to jump into the pointless as their entry point. And here's why. The difficulty. Oh my god, the difficulty. If you walked away from the joyful thinking it was far too extreme, then you're in for a brutal fucking wake up call with the pointless. Now it's hard to articulate why this game is so difficult if you've never played a Lisa title before, but I'll do my best to break it down for you. First off, there's a finite amount of enemies in this game, around 50 total, so grinding your way to success isn't a part of the equation here. Each enemy has some sort of devastating attack that will likely inflict one of the many, many status effects on your party, of which there will be little you can do to recover from outside of battle. You're left with a paltry amount of recovery items that you'll most likely burn through after each fight, leaving you hanging on by a thread of life at all times. Unlike the previous games, there are no campfires to rest at, with the exception of a couple of story-based pit stops where you'll heal up before you're thrown into the next section of extremely hard battles. You gotta keep in mind that all battles play into the bigger picture of survival, as if you make too many mistakes or you get dealt a bad hand in battle, you could be stuck with no items or health or really any way to deal with with what's to come. I recommend keeping multiple save files as you progress to prevent any sort of game halting issues from occurring. Speaking of save points, they're defaulted to one save per crow, just like painful mode. This isn't much of a problem since they are spread out frequently enough, and with a recent patch, Advenus put in a couple of baby crows which allow you to save the game anywhere, at any time, so long as you have one on hand. Nice little touch. As mentioned, the fights in the pointless are very tense. Each blow dealt to your party will feel like your entire game weighs on the next enemy move, and you know what? I was totally invested the entire time through. Just careful planning and switching sweaty armpits all the way through. Alex plays very much like Brad Armstrong, using kung fu moves as his weapon. The only difference is, Alex is canically a shitty fighter, and each of his moves often come with some sort of trade-off. For example, some of his moves will leave him unbalanced afterwards. He will constantly need to recharge his SP by doing stances, which basically means he'll be able to attack just about every other turn if you plan on using specials, which you will. The tide of battle hinges heavily on the buffs and debuffs that you cast on your party members or enemies. For example, Joel is purely a support character. He just casts buffs, debuffs, or he hides off to the side to avoid hits. He has a gun, but he never fires the single bullet that he owns. Instead, he just twirls his gun and does threatening poses and not much else. 
This may seem like a giant hindrance to a lot of gamers out there, but I quite like this unique party dynamic. Each battle beckons the player to think responsibly. Instead of turning off your brain and coasting into auto battle mode where you're just mashing buttons, like it or not, it'll take you a couple of playthroughs to figure out what the best possible path is to kill all the enemies in the game. And here's the catch. There are some missable scenes that are really important to the overall story that can be easily missed if you're not going around fighting all the battles. In a sense, you are rewarded for your efforts, which is a nice payoff to some of the more frustrating boss fights. So go out there and explore a little. You'll be glad you did. Kandrotus also tweaked the economy in Olathe a little bit in this title. There are a couple of merchants to seek out in this game, but mags are extremely scarce once again, and there's a mean trick that Kandrotus plays on you that will likely part you with your only currency early on in the game. Get ready to have a bad time. As I mentioned, this is like a multiple playthrough kind of game, and playthrough number two will tip you off to some of the pitfalls that you can avoid the next time around. Just kind of how it goes with this series of games. There's now a bartering system built into the pointless, where you can either sell unique items for mags, or barter with the trash island merchants for a chance to get a better item worth more mags, or for an item that's completely fucking useless. I thought this was an interesting mechanic and it fit perfectly into Olathe's world of untrustworthy individuals. Most of the hard choices in this game come down to resource and money management, instead of life or death scenarios. Perhaps this was a development choice to make it easier for the upcoming Chapter 2 instead of having to account for a multi-threaded plotline. Your choices will generally take you down to the same conclusion, but it may mess up your chances for survival in the carryover to Chapter 2. The game has a short enough runtime, sitting around 4 hours for the main story, and even less if you know what you're doing. I'd recommend playing through it twice to get the full effect. Okay, so I know I'm about to piss off a lot of Lisa diehards out there with this next statement. Fully prepared, I'm just gonna come out and say it. I loved my time with the pointless far more than I did with the joyful. Not to say that the joyful was terrible. I reviewed that game twice, gave it a fair shake, keep that in mind. But the pointless provided so much more variety in level design, interesting and memorable characters, musical arrangements, and the overall atmosphere just resonated with me so much more than Teenage Chisunder's Meth Quest did. That's all I'm saying. I just don't like Buddy as a character. I never did. The only reason I wanted her to be safe was predicated on my love for Brad. You can go ahead and make whatever arguments you want about her growing up in the wasteland, how Brad made the mistakes of his father when raising Buddy, and that's why she's so fucked up and unlikable. And you can have your drug-addled katana-wielding spider monkey with no redeemable qualities. I'll take my trash man any day. Both Alex and Joel have interesting backstories that aren't all unraveled for you all at once, leaving you wanting to know a little bit more. I like the irony of how Alex's childhood of poverty and his adulthood of working as a trash man plays into his present situation. No matter how many attempts he tries to escape the fact that he's a trash man, he's a natural fit as a citizen of Trash Island. Explore the plastic, stroke it good. What's neat about this one is he doesn't have a clearly defined personality, and you're given more choice in the definition of Alex with the inclusion of more choices in the dialogue options than any of the previous Lisa titles. Let's wrap this up. For the price of free, I would say give it a chance. What have you got to lose? I had a blast with this one, and I'd place it just below the painful as my favorite in the series, even though it's a fan game, I know, yeah, yeah, yeah. The amount of work and respect paid to the original series makes this experience a cut above your typical fan game. If you're a Lisa diehard that doesn't mind a little challenge in your games, then you're in for a special treat. By the way, did I mention there are a shitload of Lisa fan games out there? Jorgensen, man, I sure hope you're cooking something up. Because there's a dedicated base that are desperately wanting you to Scott Cawthon the fuck out of their eager gaping buttholes Woo! with this series, and this seems like a missed opportunity to cash in. Just fucking dial up a few Lisa fan theory Reddit threads and go to town. Doesn't matter anymore because it looks like the cancer wave has already arrived at the shore. Woohoo! Anyways, have you guys played any of the other Lisa fan games outside of the Pointless that are worth checking out? Maybe if there's enough interest, I might make a quick rundown video here in the near future about other fan games. Thanks for watching, and I'll see all you dirty gaping buttholes later.